Well, you search what is one of the most fascinating things to me. I have looked up to the sky from the time I was really young and just like, it's the only, it's the thing that gives me a headache because I think it goes on for infinity, but then what's at the end of, there's nothing, it goes, it keeps going. There must be an end, but what would that be? And is that like what you used to think when you were a kid, when you looked up to the sky? No, when I looked up to the sky as a kid, I looked up and I thought, one of those stars, there's going to be a planet and there's going to be some little kid on that planet walking along with their parent and seeing seeing our star in their sky, our sun as a star in their sky. And they're going to be wondering whether anybody is up there looking at them. I agree with you. I, I my opinion being that there's no way we're alone. Like it's, there's way too much. It's an awful waste of space. Yes. Are those actually your words? Oh no, they're the... They're the screenwriters. Was the scene of you walking with your dad in the movie part of your part of your con- contribution? Or because when you said that, that's immediately what I thought is that that was a scene in the movie. Yes. Yeah, that's really cool. How did that even come about? That's so interesting. I think we just got a phone call. I knew Carl was writing the book. I told Carl about this experience that I'd had just after I got my PhD. I went to a meeting in Washington. I think it was the American Association of Women in Science that sponsored it. Anyway, I walked into a room full of 80 women, 80 really smart, clever women. And it it just was a life-changing event. Having been the only woman in 300 of my engineering class, I had just gotten used to walking into rooms full of men, walking into this room full of women who were all bright and smart and and, um, talented. It was spectacular. We swapped stories of how we managed to make it through the pipeline when so many others didn't. Many of the women, overwhelming number of the women, their dads were the biggest influence in their life. And that was my case, right? Unfortunately, my dad died when I was young. He died when I was 12. One of the things I learned from that was this carpe diem idea. Mm. You know, don't put off asking a question of your father till tomorrow because he might not be there. And it's amazing how many of the other women had the similar kind of experience. Were there questions that you wish you would have asked? Oh, sure. Infinite number. (laughs) How do I make it through this life? How do I I deal with (laughs) Yeah, all the challenges that will be coming, right? <laughs> I didn't know enough to ask, to ask those then. I mean, you know, you say that and how do you make it through this life? And, you know, there's a lot of esoteric thoughts that go through my mind and people I speak to. And I don't know if that is the same for you, but so many people will reply with, I don't want to come back next time. Next time around, I'm not doing this. It's too hard. <laughs> do you believe in that sort of idea that you come back again? I don't think so. I, I, but I don't have any scientific data to um, support it or refute it. It just doesn't seem to be um, a mindset that is comfortable for me. Is that is that represent is that true? How scientifically based you are with everything that you believe in is that it really does need to come down to science? Is that is that the real you? Yeah, that's what I'm comfortable with. Yes, I mean, truly, my my favorite part in the movie is the scene of asking to prove love um, for your dad. And uh, I really like that was just such a I I never forgot that scene. Um, So how would you explain love then? I mean, I'm just might as well ask you, you know, if you can't prove love, how do you know? But it still exists, right? It exists. And I don't know why you have to prove it. Um, it, It's an emotion that sometimes you're lucky enough to be able to experience and share. And therefore, it's an emotion. It isn't science. Um, So I don't know why you don't just appreciate it and live with it. Does that not apply then when it comes to the question of are we alone? And that can you just believe it without proof? No, the are we alone question requires uh, an extraordinary amount of evidence to be able to, A, infer that that's what you've, that you found evidence for someone else's technology. That's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And be then interpret that evidence. And 
uh, using a lot of other expertise that I don't particularly have, but I think if that problem were posed, there would be no lack of individuals and organizations who would try to figure out what it was that we were actually finding. 2016, I think it was, where there were multiple claims of detection of extraterrestrial intelligence. There were much better explanations for each of the claims in the end. And I've been since then sort of on a hobby horse reminding people that back in the 80s at the International Academy of Astronautics and the International Institute of Space Law, we developed a set of principles um, regarding actions following the detection of extraterrestrial intelligence and really keep trying to remind people of those principles and how how to do a search and how to get confirmation of what you've found and how to tell the world. And I think if I recall back in the 80s, the the motivation for constructing this set of principles was the fact that our Soviet colleagues in the former Soviet Union we're doing SETI searches. We were concerned that if they should be successful, they would be prevented from sharing that information. So we developed this set of principles. And one of the things that says number eight is, you know, make sure that you know what you've got and then tell the world. When you think about this and you think about the technology that we have now, which we didn't have in the 1980s, There are better ways of searching, ways of searching that lend themselves to confirmation and verification and validation. Oh, really? Um, Like using two telescopes and finding the same thing in both telescopes with the right time delays between them. Mm. Um, So that's, that's sort of where I'm spending my time and effort now, that and trying to build an endowment because we now deeply understand that this may be a multi-generational search effort. Mm. And so it might be my great-granddaughter that succeeds eventually in finding evidence of someone else's technology. And so we have to find a way to keep not huge amounts of funding, but Mm -hmm. at least dependable funding year upon year, generation after generation. And of course, universities figured out how to do that millennia ago, right? Mm-hmm, they developed mm-hmm. endowments. That's a big undertaking. It is, but it's worth it. I mean, yeah. you always want the best and the brightest, right? Mm-hmm. People to be joining you and you always have to recruit your replacements. And so the recruiting job is, is somewhat difficult because you can't promise success. And most young scientists and engineers want to say, well, in my career, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to be... Mm-hmm well rewarded and famous for that. And of course, I can't say that. In fact, I have to say, "Mm -hmm. well, yeah, you make it famous, but I'm not sure I can make payroll at the end of the month. (laughs) And they're like, "Mm." how much of a passion project is this? If you do you really believe that there's life out there? It actually doesn't matter what I believe, right? This is science. And so it matters what I can prove. If I told you I knew the answer, that would be religion and not science. So what I believe doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What I can find through scientific exploration does matter. What do you want to find? Well, it's a big question. And I'd like to know what other ways there are to make a biology and to make a technology. Or is us and what happened here the only way it it can manifest? Seems unlikely. Don't know the answer to that, right? We can we can look at now. I mean, our tools are getting better all the time. We're Mm -hmm. building bigger telescopes. We're building all kinds of spacecraft for exploration. Um, I know we we've got the rovers on Mars that are uh, caching rock samples to be picked up later and Mm -hmm. to be showing that really earlier on mars was wet and warm and salty wow might have been a place where life could get started i interviewed brian cox he thought that 
by taking core samples from Mars, that maybe it would leave, it would give us some kind of understanding as to how we came about. And my question was, it might have just come about just the way that we're going to Mars and taking a core sample that like life came from somewhere else and went, oh, let's just see what's going on over here. And that it, it seems like the most likely, most likely scenario that it happened just the same. Well, that's that, uh, that idea is often called panspermia, mm -hmm. that life came from somewhere else and seeded uh, life here. And what would not necessarily disprove, but at least make less likely that story would be if we found a biology that was totally independent from life as we know it. I mean, because all life that we currently know is related right. and based on the same kind of biology mm -hmm. and um, molecular coding. Mm -hmm. If we found a totally independent uh, biology, then that would make it less likely that mm. we were clones of or seeds from someplace else. Mm -hmm.